Friends, I have come across a common question that for a given lens for optical biometry, if the A constant is 119 or say it is 119.2, what should be the equivalent A constant for immersion-based ultrasound biometry? And I'm talking here about only immersion-based biometry and not contact biometry. So the question here is, is do optical biometry A constant for a given lens has to differ from immersion-based biometry? And if so, is it different in all axial lens or in specific cases? So friends, even when you have an optical biometry, you may often have to fall back upon immersion biometry because of say, dense cataracts, or maybe posterior subcapsular cataracts, or even maybe corneal scars. So in this case, what would be the immersion biometry A constant for a given lens, whose optical biometry A constant has, has been announced by the manufacturer? Say, say it is 119.0 or 119.2. And this is a dilemma you will often find with new age IULs. For example, you know, some lenses that are manufactured beyond 2015, say for example, the new age IULs like manufactured in 2016, 17, 18, or 2019, the box A constant would likely be an optical biometry A constant. So what would be the A constant should you be doing an immersion biometry for this lens? Now friends, let me tell you that at the outset that the A constant difference between an optical biometry and ultrasound biometry, immersion-based ultrasound biometry, is not because of axial length. Yes, you heard me right. It is not because of axial length. I know I will be sounding a little strange because so long you have always believed that the A constant difference between the optical biometry and the immersion-based ultrasound biometry is because of the axial length. Well, that is not right. Among the many myths that goes in biometry, this is one of those myths. To understand this, let us take a step back in history when optical biometry Isle Master was first launched. It started measuring 2.5 millimeter of the cornea. So the optical biometry, say for example, Isle Master that was launched two decades back, it started measuring 2.5 millimeter of the cornea. Now, prior to that, the keratometry was more often done with manual keratometry, right? And with manual keratometry, we measured um, something of uh, 3.2 millimeters, right? 3.2 millimeters. Now, with two variable formulas like Holiday 1, SRK2, SRKTs, and all those two variable formulas that were there during that time, they were all optimized on the basis of manual keratometry. So with a normal prolate cornea, the most corneas are prolate corneas, right? They're steeper in the middle in the, towards the corneal vertex. And as you move towards the mid periphery region, they're flatter. So with a normal prolate cornea, this would result with optical biometry measuring, say, 2.5 millimeters with the Isle Master. The lens star measured 2.0 millimeters of the cornea. In fact, the lens star measured 1.65 millimeters and 2.3 millimeters in two dual zones. So they started measuring towards the corneal apex. So they started getting more steeper corneas. To offset this, optical biometry went with a higher A constant. And you could find the optical biometry constants for the lens that you used with immersion biometry and manual case in the ULIB website. So many a times you went to the ULIB website just to check the optimized A constant for that lens, right? Uh, that you were using, say for example, um, the Alcon single piece or the Technus lenses that you were using you know, even before the uh, optical biometry machine that you bought. So you went into the ULIP website. The ULIP website is not being updated since 2016. And you could now get an updated, uh, you know, uh, optimized A constants from the ILCON.org. 
So if you want to get the latest optimized E constants, you could always go to the ILCON.org. But uh, in gist, what I wanted to say in this slide is that the A constant difference between the optical biometry and immersion-based biometry with manual keys was because of the keratometry, because with manual keys, before the advent of the optical biometry, you measure, you know, away from the corneal vortex, and that resulted in flatter corneal values, flatter K values, right? With optical biometry, you measured smaller rings towards the corneal apex, and with the proletic cornea, you got more steeper case. And to offset that, you had to, uh, you had to, you know, offset it with a higher A constant. Okay, so that answers why there was a difference between optical biometry constant and immersion ultrasound-based biometry with manual keys. Now I need to answer you the question that may be already playing into your mind. And that question is that optical biometry measures up to RPE and ultrasound biometry measures up to ILM, that is the inner limiting membrane. So you were taught by the opt optical biometry manufacturers say that this is why it is more accurate, that it measures up to the ILM. Sorry, it measures up to the RP, and therefore the difference in A constant, right? So, well, this is not entirely true, and I have written about this in this section, Optical Biometry Myths and Science, in my website, quickguide.org, and, and you will find the link in the comment section. So, the immersion ultrasound biometry measures axial length from the corneal epithelium to the inner limiting membrane, right? It measures, uh, and let me bring the pointer here. Um, so it measures up to the inner limiting membrane, while optical biometry measures up to the RPE, so retinal pigment epithelium. That's basically what the optical biometry measures, right? So the measurement by the optical biometry is termed as optical path length, OPL and is then converted back to geometric path length by a formula, right? If uh, you have a formula and in the next slide, I will show you that's basically, you don't have to remember that formula that is done by automatically by, by the optical biometry machines. It converts the length of the optical path length, which is the length of the laser light traveling up to RP to ILM, which is the geometric axial length, right? And the calibration of the optical biometry, optical path length to immersion biometry, geometric path length was done by Ulfgang Haggis. He convincingly, he found that and he published in peer-reviewed studies. Uh, there were two studies in, uh, in two different um, immersion-based biometry machines uh, comparing with the optical biometry machine I'll master. So he won, the first study was on the AcuSonic A-Scan e Plus ultrasound machine and then, um, you know, uh, the other one was the Grishaver biometric machine. And he calibrated the optical path length into the geometric axial length so that there's no difference in axial length measured with optical biometry and the one measured with immersion ultrasound biometry. This is important because, as I said before in the last slide, because all the formulas, the SRKT, the holiday one, the two variable formulas, even the uh, Barrett, I believe, they all take the geometric axial length, that is the corneal epithelium to the, um, to the inner limiting membrane, right? So what this means that in an average axial length, I mean, in, in, in most patients, there would be no difference in optical biometry based axial length and immersion ultrasound based axial length as the output of the optical biometry based machine is matched to the output of the immersion ultrasound based axial length. So therefore, you do not need to change A constants when you are moving from immersion ultrasound to optical ultrasound, optical biometry machines. Or moving from optical biometry machines to immersion ultrasound machines only on the basis of axial length. There needs not be any change in A constant. So these are the two equations, actually, uh, you know, uh, which was used by IL Master when IL Master was first launched on, uh, you know, partial co coherence interferometry. The first equation was used 
um, by Hages to convert the OPL into the GL, that is the geometric axial length. And then, you know, the Swepso Space OCT machine, which is the Almaster 700, it also, you know, converts, it has its own, um, you know, algorithm to convert from the OPL to the GL, which is in the equation number two. Now, this is a toy calculator of a multifocal, uh, you know, a multinational company. And they seem to be recognizing this. This is from the Technis, you know, uh, this is the toy uh, IUL calculator. And you can find the spell out immersion biometry and optical biometry constants in the same bracket over here. Um, so here is, it is, I mean, you know, the optical and the immersion biometry A constants in the same bracket. But if you have an A constant, you know, if you have an ultrasound A constant, that's a different bracket. So in a separate video in future, I may cover the topic of A constant with ultrasound biometry. All right, so that was the theory part. And let me talk to you about, uh, you know, some recent updates. So there has been some studies of late that points out that optical biometry based axial length may result in hyperopic outcomes when it comes to long eyes. And by, by long eyes, as per the Wang and Koch, it is more than 25 millimeters. So they find out that in optical biometry, because they are based on single group refractive index, it overestimates the vitreous length thereby giving slightly longer axial length than it really is, thereby resulting in hyperopic outcome. So what happens is that in very long eyes, you know, the anterior chamber depth and the anterior segment size may be normal, but the vitreous length may be more. And because optical biometry machines, most optical biometry machines work on group refractive index, they don't work on segmented refractive index, they might lead to an unusually long eyes resulting in hyperopic outcome because if you get unusually long eyes, you will go for a lower ideal power resulting in hyperopic outcome. So Douglas Koch and Lee Wang first published a paper wherein they proposed a new nomogram that could be applied for axial lens that would be more than 25.2 millimeters and can be used with two variable formulas like holiday one and SRKT. I have included this nomogram in an Excel table from my site, in my site, quickguide.org, and you will find the link in the comment sections again. But Wang and Koch, again in 2018, they kind of modified the nomogram that you could use for the SRKT formula and the Holiday One formulas. They modified the nomogram. So my, um, you know, Wang and Koch for the, you know, optimization table, that I have included in the website is based on the 2018 modified version. The alternative is what David Cook and all, uh, you know, suggests in this peer-reviewed study, which was published as Immersion Ultrasound versus Optical Biometry in JCRS in 2022 July. So in this study published in JCRS July 2022, David Cook suggests a reduction of A constant by 0.23 from optical biometry if the patient's axial length is more than 25 millimeters. That is, if you are using a lens, say APC with optical biometry, and it's an A con and it has an A constant of 119.2, and you happen to do an immersion biometry for a patient because you are not being able to do an optical biometry for this patient for any reason, then you should reduce the A constant by 0.23 for axial lengths more than 25 millimeters with immersion ultrasound biometry. But for axial length less than 25 millimeters, you need not change the A constant. You keep the same A constant. Now, why is it so? Because both Wang and Koch and David Koch, they find out in their papers that with optical biometry, you have a tendency to have a false, unusually long axial length for high axial length patients. Say, if the axial length is 27 millimeters, you may land up with a little larger, slightly larger axial length with optical biometry because it is based on group refractive index and not segmented refractive index. So that's basically, you know, uh, about the A constant between immersion ultrasound and optical biometry.